what have I learned from being on the front lines, places around the world where people are persecuted for their faith? Open Doors and my team, we study incidents of persecution. Well, what does that mean? It means that we know how many people are killed for their faith who are executed because they're followers of Jesus. That's the only reason. We know how many churches are attacked. We know how many people are beaten in many places around the world. If you're a woman and a Christian, you are doubly at risk and you can be assaulted, to use a little euphemism. But there are lessons in all of that pain, in all of that tough stuff. That I think, as Andrew was saying there, he's still alive, he's in his early 90s, he's a hero of the faith, like Billy Graham was and others. Uh, what Andrew was saying there is, we need some guts. We need some courage. We need some conviction. The church in America is asleep. It's comatose. It's because we're pursuing all this other crazy stuff in the culture. And the lesson for us today is not in the culture. It's in what's happening in the toughest places where people count the cost for their faith. And they find out something really important. They find out that Jesus is good even in the tough places. And it's really powerful. I think that probably the most current example of that is, is Afghanistan. You guys been following what's going on in Afghanistan? Civilization collapsed a few weeks ago. Taliban takes over. Uh, everybody uh, here in America tries to get every Christian out, which is kind of crazy. I understand why we do it, but uh, actually we, we need to start shifting our mindset to how can we get Jesus people in if God's called them in. Does anybody want to say amen to that? I, think, think about it for a while if you need to. Let me talk about Afghanistan. There was a man, his name was Christy Wilson, kind of an establishment type person. There are establishment people, there are renegade people. Jesus uses all different kinds. And uh, Christy Wilson was a person who uh, in the 50s really felt called to Afghanistan. But Afghanistan was a closed country even then for hundreds and hundreds of years. They had a kingdom. They had Islamic extremists, and Christy Wilson, he grew up in Pakistan, so he spoke the language, he understood the culture, but he was, he was an American. But he really felt like he wanted to minister in Afghanistan, so he set up a church. When I say a church, not a physical building, but he decided to go there, teach English, and he would disciple people, professors, Americans. He, he, he wasn't allowed to talk to other Afghans about Jesus. But he did have a little bit of a church there with, with expat community in Afghanistan, in Kabul. So he, as he began to, this church, they, they, they met together for 18 years. And slowly over time, when you have the presence of God in your life, it begins to leak out and people begin to see the power of Jesus in you. And this is what happened with Christie. He's just living his life. Afghanis come to know Jesus and there begins to get this tension in the country because you're not allowed to talk about Jesus in Afghanistan. You're not allowed to decide for yourself what your faith is. But nevertheless, he carries on. Finally, after 18 years, they, they let him build a building, the only building, the only church in Afghanistan. They built this building because the president, president at that time, President Eisenhower, called the king of Afghanistan and said, would you please, this is just for Americans, diplomats, let us build a church. The king said, okay. It was built, it stood for three years. And as people were coming to know Jesus, there began to get this rumor that came back to the secret police. And the, the rumor was this, that there was an underground church. And this, this is the story of my work, that there are underground churches in North Korea. If you went, when I, I talk to the Secretary of State and, and State Department all the time, they will tell you there are no Jesus people in North Korea. I'll tell you, there's almost a half a million Jesus people in North Korea. There's an underground church. And, and there's 60,000, multiple times the size of this university, 60,000 Jesus followers in labor camps in North Korea because they had a Bible or something. It's, it's crazy. But the, the secret police in Afghanistan heard about this underground church. And the extremists, the radical extremists in 1973 were pressuring them, and they decided that they, they were going to tear it down. And, and Christy Wilson, this man, had this dream. 
when you have Jesus as your spirit and you it gives you this confirmation, this, this urgency, this, this sense, however you want to communicate it. You just feel the need to communicate what you're, what you're sensing and feeling. And so he said to the king, if you tear this church down, you will lose your kingdom. Well, July 17th. Yes, July 17th, two, uh, 1973, the secret police came, brought tractors and everything. They tore that church down. At the same time that they were tearing that church down, there was rebel forces, Islamic Taliban folks, who went and overthrew the king the same night. And it has been a veil of tears in Afghanistan ever since. No established church. Interestingly, when they tore the church up, they literally dug underneath the foundation because they wanted to find the underground church. They thought it was literally underground. I tell you that story because the gospel has been done in Afghanistan since 1973, right? No church. Well, of course, that's not right. Same time, Brother Andrew, this gentleman, my friend, who started this ministry all those years ago, he crossed over the border in 1973 from Pakistan through these little roads, through the mountains, whatever, and started to talk about Jesus. You know, it's just as simple as giving them a Bible, talking to them about what's going on, and baptize people in Jesus' name. And we're, we're still there today. There are 10,000 followers of Jesus in Afghanistan. When you talk to these folks, and I had a, a, a very sort of secretive phone call with one of them yesterday because you can't talk. They're being monitored all the time. So you can't talk too, you can't talk too clearly because otherwise they'll get arrested and executed. So we were talking, and the one thing that always comes through to me is these people are happy. Jesus is with them. They're under pressure. They got worries. They're concerned. Are they going to live? Are they going to die? But they have that something. And then I look around. And I live in Southern California. I look around Southern California, and Jesus' people are worried that they're going to get sick, and they don't want to go to church for two years, and they're afraid that this, this somebody going to say something bad. I mean, we have become a shadow of what Jesus had in mind. And I think I know why. There's a, there's a story in the Bible about a woman who, you, you'll recall this, I think, who has this issue going on in her body and she's bleeding and she is desperate to touch Jesus. So she goes through the crowd. Raise your hand if you know this story because I'm just giving you the sketch. She goes through the crowd and she touches him now, let me ask you a question. It changed her, right? Just healed. How long do you suppose she was with Jesus? Five minutes? Does somebody say five minutes? Yeah. Well, could it have been 10, 15? Let's use five. When she died, and until she died, if certainly she did, do you think she told that story? Of course. And when they, when they did her eulogy, assuming they did a wake or whatever they would call it back in the day, I'm sure they talked about it. Five minutes with Jesus. Five minutes with Jesus. Changed everything. It gives you courage. 1 Corinthians 16, uh, 16, verse 13 says this. If you could pull it up. I think it's up here somewhere. Be on guard. Stand firm in your faith in God, respecting his precepts, keeping in mind your sound doctrine. Act like mature men and women. Be courageous. Be strong. A few minutes with Jesus will do that for you. You don't have to manufacture it. You don't have to pretend you don't have to pose be people of courage be people of courage this entire country is trying to make you afraid 
It's trying to convince you, you shouldn't die. You should never get sick. Uh, stop living in order to stay alive. And I'm telling you, this is not the message of the gospel. You be wise, do everything you can, listen to all the great doctors, but be people of courage. I went to North Africa to meet with the man who runs the entire underground network in Libya. Libya has had a leader, Muammar Gaddafi. Some of you guys remember, this guy was nuts. He was crazy, he was an extremist. He killed, and he, you know what he used to do? He used to take all of the young kids, if you're a good student in here, imagine this. There might be one or two, perhaps, I don't know. Uh, he would take all of the really smart kids out of school, decade after decade, year after year, because he never wanted anybody in his country to be smart enough to challenge him. So if you're smart, you didn't get to go to school. What a crazy idea. He was overthrown, executed in the public square, and the country is divided into three. But the one thing all of the governments decide on, the one that's approved by the UN, the militants and the tribal folks, all three of these governments in this lawless land agree on is no Christians. So this guy who works in Libya, he's tough. Because if he's ever found, he'll be killed. Courage. And I went to meet him. I flew into Tunisia and to Tunis, which itself is kind of unsettled these days. And, and then uh, we made our way to another part of North Africa where we were going to meet. I don't fit in in North Africa, okay? So I had to put on a hat. What it, it's all just fakery because there's no way I'm going to blend in. So what they do is they do this thing that in the trade craft they call dry cleaning. They put you in this weird configuration in order to lose anybody that's following you. Not just to protect me, but because if this guy is found with me, he's killed. So, and often when I go into these areas, uh, people, they'll try to follow me and just arrest everybody I ever meet with and then take them to prison. And they'll let me, I'll just go back and I'm like, hey, this is a great trip. Uh, but everybody's been hurt in my wake. So I try to be very careful. So we go through this very convoluted process in order to lose my ta people tailing me. I go into a hotel. I walk around the hotel. I said, have some coffee. Uh, you know, then I walk out the back of the hotel, in through the back of a dry cleaner, out the back of a dry cleaner, upstairs, downstairs, down the other thing, in and out of buildings. It took about an hour. Uh, and I never w actually didn't go that far from the, in the city that I was in at that time. I was, you know, all within the same amount of blocks. And finally, I got up to uh, the, the place, the building where we were going to meet. We went up through some stairs, went into this room that already all the shades are drawn when nobody, this and that, they already swept to make sure nobody had any listening devices or whatever. And I gotta tell you, I live in Newport Beach. Okay, that's not my life. I was freaked out. Uh, because there's a burden of knowing that life hangs in the balance just because you're following Jesus. And I was just, it was just unsettling. And I was fearful. And then I came in and met with this guy. And I don't know what I expected. But this guy had the biggest smile on his face. And he just gave me this big hug. And we started to talk. And we started to sing together, and we just prayed together. We were together for hours. And in that lesson, in that moment, I realized that I am so self-sufficient. I just, I won't even spend five minutes with Jesus sometimes. Has anybody else ever confessed that? Sometimes you just don't even want to pick up your Bible and read. And uh, by the way, I went to Bible college. So I know why and how it, when you're required to do something that's problematic sometimes. And I was laid bare, basically, by this guy whose whole life is at risk because Jesus has changed his life. And here I am. I'm going to go back to Newport Beach. And uh, it really convicted me. Courage.
people of courage. The other thing I notice is that they all have cohorts. The strategy of the devil, in my opinion, uh, I see this in North Korea, I see it in Afghanistan, I see it in Tunisia and, and uh, Libya, wherever we're at, is that he tries to isolate us. You, you be alone, because when you're alone and discouraged, he can just pick you off and you start talking to yourself and you've got these, you're relaying things in your head and you're just replaying it and you're just feeling sorry for yourself and you, there's nobody to challenge it because you're all isolated. You need a cohort. You need the right people around you. You need brothers and sisters. We gotta stick together. That's another reason why, however you do it, however safely you do it, we need to be together. You need to have partners and friends and you need to, you need to have this something that you, can, that you can pull towards together. Don't choose the easy path, be a person of courage. When I look at the church of the future, let me tell you who the great ministers are going to be. Bankers, it's so hard to get money into uh, these areas. Uh, cryptocurrency, all these kind of things. Technology people, nurses, teachers, agriculture. If you wanted to get into, into North Korea to help people, the, the easiest way to do it is to know something about agriculture because they're starving. And the government will even let Americans in if you know something about agriculture. God is calling people to a, a, a great adventure. And we're just like kind of asleep. The whole world is falling apart and we're all just kind of observing it. I'm telling you, there's vibrancy here. Spend some time with Jesus. It's gonna bring courage to you, but you cannot do it alone. You need to be with each other. And the other th message I want to give you, and I just have a couple more minutes, I want to give you is everything I've said is likely to depress you. Except this, uh, that God has called you to be a happy warrior. In 1 Corinthians 16, verse 8, it says this. Maybe you could pull it up for me. Uh, because a wide door of, for effective service has opened to me in Ephesus, and there are many adversaries. In, in, uh, in the other translations, it basically says, great things are happening, but, but, but people are against me. Does that sound at all like today? Great things are happening. Great things are happening. Yes, you are opposed and you will be considered intolerant. I don't care how liberal you try to be. If you follow Jesus, people do not want you to speak. I have Jesus people around the world who are communists, who are all manner of different political parties. It does not matter. They still are opposed because Jesus was opposed. So you can't finagle into some sort of political comfort zone. Great things are happening. Be a happy warrior. Everywhere I go, whether it's in Libya, whether it's in North Korea, one of the happiest people I ever met was a North Korean believer. Same kind of deal. Went through this whole big thing to, to meet with them. And very, very difficult, uh, very scary. And I get all nervous. And here, it's this joyful person. Happy words. Why is that? Five minutes with Jesus. That's why. Uh, Shakespeare was... Uh, Shakespeare, some of you guys have read him, maybe some of you don't. I've never gotten, I never quite understood his cadence and language and so forth. Sorry to the English professors here. But uh, he had a way of capturing an idea. And I'm just going to close with this idea. Uh, this idea of a happy warrior has traveled throughout history. We always think of the oppression, you know, when you start talking about difficult things, you think you, you got to be somber, you have to be unhappy, you have to be, but actually the idea of a happy warrior is a Jesus idea, that you have joy in the midst of suffering and challenge, and it's all through the New Testament. It's, the, it's not that you deny it, you just, you just have the presence of Jesus. And Shakespeare found this, he found it in Julius Caesar, who had, he was a, a warrior. He conquered much of the known world at the time. People loved fighting with him because he had a joyfulness about him. And then Henry V, 
uh, also, same thing. And from Henry V, Shakespeare pulled this. I'm going to read it to you and see if it doesn't capture an idea for you. He's talking about a battle they fought, like today, where you have problems. You don't feel good. You've got money problems. The world doesn't seem to be going your way. Have courage, friend. Be happy. If you're following and spending time with Jesus, you can have a good adventure. So we, they're talking about this battle of St. Crispin's Day, and here's how Shakespeare communicates this speech from, the, from King Henry. He says, he's talking to his soldiers. He says, from this day, from this day, from this Tuesday, to the end of the world, we in it, people of courage, people of prayer, people with relationship with Jesus, we in it, from this day, we're going to be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. Do you ever spend time in community with brothers and sisters? For today, he who sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, be he ever so vile. What does that mean? That doesn't matter how strange you are, how quirky you are, God can use you. And if God is using you and you're submitting your life, you're my brother, you're my sister. To this, this day, the fact that you fought, the fact that you were a person of courage, the fact that you're part of the resistance, this day shall gentle his condition, make him of a higher quality. And people, gentlemen in England, now asleep. Remember I said the church was asleep? Do you argue with me on that? Gentlemen in England, now asleep, shall think themselves cursed that they were not here and hold their manhoods cheap while any of us that fought on this day speaks. It's a powerful idea that we live with this something. You can't get it on your own. It's time spent with Jesus. He'll give you courage. He'll give you fight. What is your battle? I don't know. But I want to pray a blessing over you today. There are people around the world who are persecuted for their faith. They, they speak out. They live for Jesus because they found he's worth it. He's there even in the most dark place. I have one friend who's a North Korean prisoner. She sang every day, every day of her captivity in prison in the most vile conditions. And people would hear just the song. She never got to say much, but she could sing, and they couldn't stop her she was spending time with Jesus. It just spread throughout the camp. They had to eventually let her go. It's just bothersome to people. I mean, just powerful ideas. I could go on all day, but I'm going to pray a blessing for you. I'm going to pray courage for you. I'm going to pray that you wake up and see the opportunity around you. I'm going to pray that God will give you a great blessing and a cohort. That's what I'm going to pray. Bow your heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for the students here at Jessup today. I'm sure you have them here for a reason. Give them courage. Uh, not uh, outside, not just from their temperament, not from the outside culture. They're never going to find it there. But would I pray in their prayer time, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, that they would get a picture and a strength and a courage that would give them an unusual presence in this day and age when everybody is so afraid. I think there are great leaders in this place. We need them. We need them. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.